Have you ever wondered what an ACH payment is or how it works, I mean the actual nuts and bolts of how it really works? If so, then you have come to the right place. Welcome to a presentation we have titled ACH 101 or What you always wanted to know about ACHs but were afraid to ask. The following presentation was taken from a webinar by the Accredited Standards Committee X9. X9 is a standards body which is tasked with creating standards for the United States financial industry. The instructor for this video is Sharon Jablin, an expert in ACH technology for the Clearinghouse. If you find this video helpful, please like it and subscribe to our X9 channel. Thank you and now to the presentation. Okay, hello and welcome to x webinar, ACH 101, what you always wanted to know but were afraid to ask. My name is Ian Breyer Frazier and I will be your host for this afternoon. Uh, before we get started, we have just a few reminders for our guests. You'll notice that everyone has been placed on global mute. So um, this is just to ensure that there isn't any distracting background noise uh, during the presentation. There will be time for Q&A session at the end of the webinar, but if you have questions during the presentation, please feel free to submit them in the chat area. Um, to submit a question, just open up the chat box and um, submit your questions, but be sure to send questions to everyone. Uh, this will just allow the host and the presenter to be able to see the questions that are submitted. <laughs> just want to note that, um, that uh, like all of our previous webinar, webinars, today's webinar is being recorded and will be available on our website, x9.org, by tomorrow. Uh, a link to the recording and the slide deck will be provided to all attendees as soon as the recording is available. So you'll want to be on the lookout for that. Also, at the end of the webinar, you'll receive a link to a brief two-minute survey. We ask um, that if you could please just complete the survey as it will help us to plan for future webinars. And um, now I'm gonna turn things over to Steve Stevens, X-Line's Executive Director, for a brief welcome and introduction. Steve? Great, thanks, Ambria. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay, I wanna make sure I wasn't still on mute. Welcome everybody to, the, to today's uh, webinar on ACH payments. I'm happy uh, you could attend. Uh, first thing, I wanna thank a couple of people that helped uh, make this happen today. First is the American Bankers Association, specifically Diane Poole and Tab uh, Stewart. They were able to get the webinar notice in the ABA's daily newsletter. And uh, so thank you for that. Also uh, to Mark Kilman, uh, who uh, works for the uh, Federal Reserve Bank of Atlanta. He's also the chair of our membership and marketing committee. And I believe uh, due to his efforts, we have at least five or six of the uh, Fed Bank's representative to represent it today, and I believe Atlanta has at least 30 members. So welcome to all the members of the Federal Reserve that are attending today. Uh, because we have so many people on the call today that probably uh, that aren't uh, X9 members or familiar with X9, I'm going to give you a two-minute overview and condense about an hour-long presentation down to that. So prepare to get hit with a fire hose worth of information, and you can always contact us later if you have any questions. X9 is a 40-year-old uh, organization. We were started by the American Bankers Association to create uh, stand, uh, standards for check. And our check group is still very active today. Uh, so, uh, they have standards on everything, to, what you can pre-print on a check, including the uh, magnetic ink or micro line. And they also today have all the return codes. And uh, if you think checks are going away, I think uh, last year, if I remember correctly, about 50 billion checks were processed. And it turns out that while the overall trend is down for the last uh, number of years, there was a little bit of an uptick and turns out that small and medium-sized companies have found a, a rediscovered checks a little bit. So a little bit about uh, our, our membership. We have a little over 100 members. You can go out on our website and see who they are. We have most of the major banks, plus some medium and small banks, uh, all the card brands, ATM manufacturers, uh, at least one of the ATM networks. 
uh, several payment processors, Federal Reserve Bank, U.S. Treasury, Office of uh, Financial Research, NIST, and quite a few others. So uh, we have a rather broad uh, spectrum of companies so that we can have a balanced uh, view when we look at standards. Uh, X9 is accredited by ANSI, uh, the, the U.S. standards uh, oversight body that audits us to make sure that we provide uh, uh, all the requirements that they have for standards. We have a little over 120 domestic standards and over 25 international standards. We also represent the United States internationally on three ISO technical committees. Uh, the main one being uh, TC68, which is basically the international version of X9. It's also the home of ISO 20022 messaging standard, which most banks uh, have heard. It's, it's a widely used standard outside of the United States and is gaining popularity within the U.S. Our standards cover uh, the following technology areas, uh, checks, mobile payments, automation of legal orders. This is uh, when banks get uh, uh, subpoenas or get orders from the courts or to provide information. We have standards that are going to allow that to be uh, performed by computers now instead of by having so many people. We have corporate treasury, securities. If you've ever seen a stock or bond and seen the QCIP number, on it, that's uh, X9.6. That's one of our standards. We have uh, a large encryption uh, group that uh, protects, uh, has standards that protect data at both rest and in motion. Things like tokenization, PKI, RSA, all these acronyms, ASE, all the different um, types of encryption. We also have, to have distributed ledger, which is used in some digital currencies. Data breach, quantum safe uh, encryption. If you're not familiar with the risk from quantum computers, we have a group that uh, does nothing but uh, work on that particular risk. Uh, if you're interested in that, uh, we would love to have you join our group. Uh, we have e commerce, and we're one of the uh, major developers or helped with the 2022 messages. And the uh, what the United States is using mostly now, 8583, was originally an X9 standard. And there's many more. I've just barely touched the surface. But you can contact myself or any of your staff member would be happy to provide you with more details. Now what you're all here for today is uh, our webinar on ACH. Uh, and sometimes called the 101 class, or everything you always want to know about ACHs, but we're afraid to ask. I've actually been through it twice, and I can tell you I've learned something each time. Sharon has a little something for every level of person that might be interested. Uh, I think uh, as she'll get down a little bit in the weeds for a few minutes to show some of the people that may be interested how things actually work at the bottom level. But she has a lot of great information about timings, and at the end of toward the end of the presentation, she has comparison between ACHs, wire uh, transfer, and real-time payments. So, uh, Sharon Jablon is going to be your presenter today. She's also a member of. She's with the Clearinghouse. She's also a member of X9 Board, and I've worked with her for a number of years. At the Clearinghouse, uh, Sharon is director and product specialist involved across a number of product offerings, including ACH and chips. Sharon focuses on expanding payment capabilities and spearheading initiatives, including the UPIC and the STP820 remittance standard. She's also part of the project team tasked with migrating chips and the clearinghouse's other high value payment systems to utilize uh, 2022 which i was just talking about sharon serves as the uh, clearinghouse's representative to a number of standard bodies including x12 finance uh, of course the x9 the nacho payments alliance iso 2022 payment seg which is part of the rmg that we're also a member of and then the Business Payments Coalition. So at this time, I'd like to turn the meeting, the webinar over to Sharon and let her begin her presentation. Sharon, it's all yours. Okay, thank you, Steve, and thank you, Ambria. Thanks for the introduction, and as Steve said, I'm Sharon Jablon, 
And I do work across product lines being involved with ACH and CHIPS, but I am going to say that ACH is my first love. So today I'm going to provide um, an overview of the USACH, and I'll be adding detail and color from my perspective and what I've learned over the years. My goal um, is to give you a picture of how the ACH works so that you can compare it to other payment systems or even applications that you know. I have been accused of being in the weeds too much, but the way I see it and the way I learn, I can't learn something without seeing some detail. So you don't have to remember the detail that I'm going to present, but I think it will substantiate the big picture. So um, please bear with me. Um, and before I go on, I want to thank Chip Savage from our marketing department who reformatted my presentation and made it look really very professional. Okay, so here we go. Um, I have to put part of, part of this is that I have to put up this disclaimer, but I want to say that this presentation is really for educational purposes only, and it's not to be construed as legal advice. Um, so for those of you who don't know the Clearinghouse and our payment systems and services, um, we have four payment systems that we operate. EPN, as I said, my first love, that's the Clearinghouse's private sector ACH. Um, it's the, our competition, um, the alternative is the um, Fed ACH, and we both do clearing and settling for ACH transactions. Um, you may know us under the brand SVP code, that is our check image entity. Uh, CHIPS high value payment system, uh, it is our wire payment system. I'll talk about that just a bit towards the end of the presentation. And the competition in the United States for high value payments is Fedwire. And of course, RTP, which probably many of you have heard of, um, we introduced in two November of 2017. It's the first new payment rail in the United States in 40 years. So that's quite exciting. In addition to that, we have under our umbrella two member services organizations. One is the TCH Payment Association, TCHPA, which provides um, uh, payment information, rule support, education, and professional services. And there's also ECHO, which is, does all kinds of check-related ad advocacy, rules, education, et cetera. In the big picture, the Clearinghouse settles, clears and settles about $2 trillion daily. So, you know, we process nearly half of the ACH funds transfer and check image in the United States. Um, so, as you know, this is really about ACH, so I'm going to dive into ACH and we're going to talk about all things ACH. So, I'll start with the beginning. Um, and we'll talk about the characteristics, the participants, how payments flow, what they look like, what the files look like, what routing numbers mean to the ACH. Um, you'll hear, hear terms like SEC code. Those are standard um, entry class codes that define the different types of ACH transactions. I'm going to touch on EDI. You'll see some um, graphics with file organization, so you actually see how ACH files look, and you can think about how that is so different than other file formats. Um, Steve asked me to put in a little bit on ACH volume. I've included that. Um, and we'll talk about other things, including processing schedules, how, how payments flow, uh, exceptions, rules enforcement, and a comparison of the pay various payment systems characteristics. All right, so what is ACH? So ACH um, actually stands for Automated Clearing House, ACH Payments. It's a method for transferring funds basically from one institution to another. And I want to say, and I'll say it again, in terms of the clearinghouse, 
the banks are our customers. We're getting payments from banks and moving them on to receiving banks. It's designed to be fast um, and a very reliable methodology of processing payments. So needless to say, there's a computer and computers in the middle of all of this, but ACH generally is, is defined as it's a batch store and forward system. We get in files of batches of payments and we process them. We get them, we take a look at them, and then we move them on, store and forward. Um, transactions can be either credits or debits. Um, we categorize them as either consumer or corporate. They can be government or commercial, and they typically settle in one or two days after processing. But over the last couple of years, we now have same-day processing and settlement. And I will call your attention to the graphic on the right that you've probably all laughed at a little bit. Um, so the ACH started in um, around 2070, I'm sorry, 1972. And if you take a look at this graphic, this guy looks so 1970s with the big bell, bell bottoms and the big hair. It makes me laugh. Okay, NACHA. So NACHA is integral to the ACH network. They, NACHA stands for National Automated Clearinghouse, NACHA. It's a trade association, and it really is much, much more than just about the ACH. However, relative to the ACH, um, NACHA administers the rules and regulations for all ACH processing. And it unites basically all the networks of, the network of financial institutions and their businesses and consumers into one um, very um, formidable processing network. Um, I, I'll probably say this again later, but because of the way the ACH network is designed, we can all, depending on how you count, all 12 to 14,000 banks can be reached through the ACH network. Um, on an annual basis, NACHA produces this booklet, that, not booklet, this book that's on the uh, graphic to the right. It's about three or four inches wide and it has um, all of the rules and guidelines for processing ACH payments from the operator um, responsibilities to the bank responsibilities to third party responsibilities. Um, the rule book is available through NACHA, through EPN, um, you can, it is also available to, to, um, to look at uh, if you have a license to look at the rules. And the, I gave you the website where you can even uh, go to the website and see what it's all about. Um, in addition, NACHA has a, a certification for ACH, um, the AAP, and the, base, the, the goal of that is to certify individuals that have a, an in-depth knowledge of the ACH, um, a very broad knowledge of all aspects of it. So the NACHA 2020, 2020 rules book and all the years before, the ACH is about rules, rules, and more rules. Okay, so where does the clearinghouse um, come into play with EPN, the Electronic Payments Network, oh, Sharon, you're back. Um, I'm back. Um, I think I'm still sharing. Let me put it in presentation mode. My phone just went dead as we okay. were uh, while we were meeting. So, no worries. All right. So let's see where I am here. Um, I think I was just starting about who EPN is and the TCHPA. So, you know, the Clearinghouse, as I mentioned, was formed in 1852, but um, relative to ACH, we created our ACH entity called NIAC, NYACH, in 1975. And, um, and in a minute, we're going to be talking about um, Fed routing numbers and federal Fed districts. 
um, we were the we are the second well New York area. The Northeast is in the second federal district. In 1999, we changed our name to EPN, Electronic Payments Network, and then and from that point on, we were offering and providing processing services um, to financial institutions across the country. Also, you know, we have the TCHPA, I mentioned that all, earlier, they are one of the RPAs, the Regional Payment Associations, that provide support um, on education and publications, provide publications and rules interpretation. So they're a great group. Um, I did, okay, let's go to the next slide. So let me talk a little bit about ACH. And this slide is gonna come up at the very end of the session where I'll compa compare ACH to CHIPS and RTP. Um, okay, so some of this I mentioned before, but it, it's really what makes the ACH different. You know, these are, are amongst our characteristics. Um, so we are a batch processing store and forward. We process credits or debits and debits. Payments can be up to a penny less than $100 million. There are one-day and two-day credits and one-day debits with same-day capability. So in terms of settlement, we settle one or two days after processing. And then the two same-day windows each have their own settlement. And we will be going to a third settlement, a third window in March 2021. And that's going to be great for uh, the West Coast, which today have to get their same-day transactions in by about 2.30, and this will take it to 4.30. So transactions can be returned or reversed, um, which is, you know, not something that's, that you see in other payment systems. Um, we follow the NACHA file format, and I want to be clear, both the Clearinghouse and the Fed follow the NACHA, the Fed ACH, follow the NACHA file format. And that's what makes us able to play so well together because we follow the same rule. Um, in terms of EPN, banks send files of transactions to us throughout the day, seven by 24, and we take them in and we distribute to the banks, our banks, on um, business days. And I've mentioned before, um, our competition there is Fed ACH. All right, routing numbers. Routing numbers are integral to how the ACH works. Um, all financial institutions that participate in the ACH have routing numbers. And, you know, for those of you who still have checks, your routing number of your bank, the main routing number or what, whatever the bank has assigned to you, appears on the bottom of your check to identify, you know, what financial institution that check was drawn on. But that Routing number also is integral to define a bank in the USACH. And you can see on the graphic on the right, the 12 um, Federal Reserve districts. So routing numbers start with two digits. And for example, in the New York and the Northeast, 02 is the first two digits of our routing number. And that's going to, routing numbers are going to be in just about every record in the ACH, and I'll be pointing them out. And by the way, there's a link on this page, so if you want to look up a routing number, you can click on um, FRB services and go in there and put in a routing number, put in a bank name, and you'll be able to, you know, if it's a valid routing number, find them. So Acuity is the registrar of the um, routing numbers, uh, and they can be looked up at the Fed website. Okay, participants. There are five participants, and then there's third parties, but five participants that you need to know about in the ACH. And all of these participants, um, their roles and responsibilities are laid out in elaborate detail in the NACHA rules book. So we have the originator, that's the person who is originating or sending the transaction, requesting the transaction. There's the 
ODFI, the originating depository financial institution, that's the bank that the originator participates with. There is the ACH operator, that's either EPN from the clearinghouse or Fed ACH, the two US ACH operators. There is the RDFI, the receiving depository financial institution. That's the receiver of the transaction. They're gonna get their transactions from the operator. And then the receiver, the individual or corporation who is receiving the transaction. And then there are third parties that basically help and assist banks and corporates and consumers that have software that just keep things going for um, banks and corporates who, you know, aren't processing necessarily on their own. All right, so this, now there's gonna be a couple of graphics. Um, and the intention of this graphic is twofold. One is to show you the layout of the participants. So the layout of the participants, you can see there's an originator, a person or a business, that could be me, Sharon, or Sharon's hat company. And I um, send my transactions, or my bank helps me make transactions. Um, my bank is the ODFI, that's the originating bank, right? So Sharon's transactions go to her bank. Um, the ODFI sends the transactions to the ACH operator they participate with. Um, that could be EPN at TCH or Fed, Fed ACH. And we, we the operators, process those payments. And now, uh, this particular graphic is for credit transactions. So we, the operators, then process those payments by looking through every line and every, of every transaction, deciding, figuring out where, because it's specified by routing number, where the transaction is going to, and we give those payments to the receiving financial, receiving depository financial institution, the receiver's bank. So, um, and then the receiver, the receiving bank, posts the transaction to the receiver's account, and then the receiver has that uh, funds in their account. So, you know, in this particular graphic, it could be Sharon's Hat Company sending a payment to my son Daniel Jablon, or uh, Daniel's Boat Company, or what have you. So those are the players, the originator, the ODFI, the ACH operator, the RDFI, and the receiver, and the way the arrows go in this um, graphic, these are for credit transactions. Similarly, but not exactly the same, this is for a debit transaction. And I like to see them set up differently, just like this, so that you can see the difference between a credit and a debit. So if Sharon was going to debit, um, to, to create a debit, perhaps, or to allow a debit, um, I might send, want to debit Daniel's account. I could send a debit transaction to my financial institution who would send that payment to their ACH operator. Their ACH operator, in effect, is going to um, send, the, send the, or distribute, give that payment to Daniel's bank who will debit Daniel's account if the rules have been adhered to, and there are many, many rules, debit Daniel's account and make those funds available that will ultimately go back to Sharon. So that's the difference of a payment flow from a credit to a debit, and these are the participants. These are the five participants. Okay, so a little bit about the roles and responsibilities of all of the parties. Um, the originator, again, that can be a company or an individual, an employer, what have you. They create files of transactions that they are going to send to their bank destined to the, the receivers that they want their payments to go to. Um, relative to what their role is, the originator, there are um, authorizations that have to be gotten from their receiver. Um, there are agreements between the originator and their bank, the ODFI, or perhaps with any intermediary third party. Um, there are lots of rules and all of them have to be adhered to. Um, the ODFI, they're the bank, they were the second um, player in the chain that I showed you. They receive those 
entries, or I call them transactions, from the originator, perhaps from Sharon or Sharon Cat Company. The bank takes those transactions, they put them into files, um, and they prepare them to be tr transmitted to the ACH operator, their ACH operator. Those transactions are identified by routing numbers in the batch header. That's how the um, originator, originating bank um, identifies themselves. And of course, there are warranties and responsibilities on the ODFIs, the banks, and they have to adhere to those. And then there's the ACH operator. What is our role? Um, the operators, we receive a, files all day of transactions and we receive them from our participating banks and we sort through all of the entries and we, we look for the routing numbers of where those transactions are going. Um, and then we put them in buckets and I'll show you more about that. And we put them in buckets based on who those transactions are going to. And then we put all those files, um, those those transactions together into batches and batch them up to be ready to deliver them to the receiving financial institution. At the same time, sometimes, and I will be showing you pictures of this, transactions come into, for example, EPM, and we look at it and we see that it's destined for a bank that doesn't participate with us. And in that case, we hand those transactions off to FedACH for them to deliver. Um, and the Fed does the reverse. They will get transactions from their banks, and if they're destined for an EPN bank, they will hand those transactions off to us. In addition to all that, we, the ACH operators, are responsible for the clearing, delivery, and settlement of all of these transactions. Uh, the RDFI, the RDFI, the receiving financial institution, so they are going to receive files of electronic payments from the ACH operator. They're going to look at them. They are going to post them to the receiver's account. And another one of their responsibilities, and there are many, is that they have to provide the receiver with a periodic statement. So if you've ever looked at your, as a consumer, if you look at your statement, sometimes you might see PPD credit. That's the type of direct deposit credit. And there are certain fields that have to go on your statement. Well, it's the responsibility of your, of the bank that's delivering those payments to you, your bank, to make sure that they put the required information, required, uh, on your statement. And that all of those requirements are spelled out in the NACHA rules book. Um, and they're also responsible, of course, for timely posting, of funds availability, and again, there's all this very specific rules about when a payment must be posted by and when the funds must be available. Um, and then the receiver, the receiver of the payment. Um, they authorize uh, to their bank that they want to have ACH, that they will receive credits and or debits um, that can be applied to their account. And they can be corp receivers or corporates or consumers. And there are all kinds of rights that consumers and uh, con consumers and corporates have and, and rules on when they have to do certain things. And all of that is spelled out, again, in the NACHA rules book. Okay, so trick question, and I don't have you sitting here looking at me, so I'm gonna ask, where is NACHA in this picture? Because um, over the years, you know, I'll, 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 people would come up to me or I'd have conversations with someone and they'd be saying that NACHA is processing their payments. And so to be clear, NACHA does not process payments. NACHA administers the rules that run the ACH. They don't have hardware that takes in transactions and pumps out transactions. And in fact, when NACHA and I love NACHA. <laughs> when um, NACHA publishes the statistics for the network, they get those statistics from both the clearinghouse and FedACH and from banks. Okay, so now we're gonna go on and talk about credits and debits. Um, 
So credits, what are credits used for? Credits are used by both consumer, credit payments are made by consumer and corporates. Um, and they're to instruct the network to move a payment from one financial institution to another to get it to the receiver's account. And the most common is direct deposit of payroll. And uh, about 93% of all Americans use direct deposit. Um, so what are some of the other things that payroll, you know, for, for ACH credits are for social security and government payments and pensions and dividends and all kinds of um, generally often repetitive types of transactions, sometimes repetitive transactions, but um, direct deposit into the receiver's account. Um, what about ACH debits? ACH debits are instructions to collect funds from a receiver's account. Um, they're used by corporate, sometimes for corporate consolidation. Corporates can have many, many accounts. For example, it could be, uh, you know, a, a restaurant chain, and the funds come out of that restaurant chain uh, daily and get put into their branch office. That's, a, that's how corporates often use debits. Um, and debits are also used by consumers for um, mortgages and insurance premiums, um, club dues, um, you know, a variety of different um, reasons that people sign up for and say, you have the ability to debit my account. Okay, ACH settlement. Well, settlement is actually uh, settlement is the actual transfer of funds between the financial institutions. Um, whereas clearing is really the process of updating the accounts of the trading parties, the banks, and arranging for the transfer of the money um, between the accounts. And this is also all done by routing number, and the accounts are kept at the Federal Reserve. And one of our roles as the ACH operators um, and EPN, we reflect on advices that we send to our banks um, throughout the day um, that tells them what their position is through, you know, throughout each settlement activity. Um, settlement occurs may, regular, uh, well, I'm going to say non, non same day settlement occurs every day at 8.30 a.m. in the morning, Monday through Friday. Um, and same day today, there were two additional settlements at one and at five to correspond to the same day windows. There were two today, and there will be a third um, uh, next March. And so we also, we send three, we send settlement files to the FRB throughout the day, and we're informing them what the net credit or debit position is of our banks. Um, we did get a question. I'm, I'm not 100% sure of this, but I will say that relative to the EIP payments um, for the CARES Act that have been flowing through the ACH, my understanding is that we've been processing about 40% of those payments. Um, not 100% on that, but that's what I understand that to be. So now I'm going to go into what I'll call maybe the more geeky part of this, this presentation. And it's really the part that I kind of like the best because it really shows how the ACH works and how it's different from any other system that I know. So in terms of terminology, we have records, files, batches, and entries. Entries I call transactions, but they're entries. And um, with, and, and so let me just explain that in terms of records in an ACH file, and I'm going to be showing you an example in a minute, there are six types of record types. Um, and we, call, we have numbers for them. There's the one, five, six, seven, eight, and nine, and they all correspond to a different function. I'll show you that in one minute. Um, each ACH record is 94 characters. It's fixed record length. That may sound um, old fashioned, but it really works. And within each 94 characters, there are in individual fields. 
that are designated for different pieces of information, and it all depends on the record type. So a, a, a one record or a five record or a six record and what have you have all different record layouts. Okay. So um, ACH files are groups of batches that are initiated into the ACH. So we get files from our banks, and in each file, there are many, many, many batches. Um, and in those batches, there are groups of records that define the different types of transactions um, that are requested to be processed. And then uh, one of the record types is actually the entry, and that's I call that, that's the payment instruction, and that says where the funds are to go to in the ACH. And all of these fields, that are within each record, within each transaction, within each batch, and in the file. All of these fields um, have requirements. They can be mandatory, and mandatory means that we, the ACH operator, when we get it, we are, have to edit it, and we have to look at it and make sure that it's absolutely right before we process it, and it means if it's mandatory and it's not right, we are going to reject that transaction um, or batch or file. There are fields that are required. That means that um, it could cost the receiving bank to return them if they didn't fill out properly that field. Or it could be that a field is designated as optional. And that means that the originator may have put something, the originator's bank may have put something in that field. But in the big picture, everything is very orderly and definitive. There aren't there's not a lot of questions as to what a field is supposed to be. Okay, so this is the overarching structure of um, an ACH file. The first record in the file, it happens to be called the one record, is the file header. And it basically says, where did this file come from and where is it going? So is it coming from bank A and going to EPN? Um, and then, and so there's a file header, and you can see in red the file header, and then the file control. And the file control is kind of a grand total of all of the things that are in the file. And that's to make sure that everything tallies up in the file um, that we received from an originating bank. Because if something isn't quite right, we are not going to process that file. Okay, then within the file, there are a series of batches. Um, and each batch starts with a batch header and ends with a batch control. And the batch header said, um, basically says, you know, what company is it from and what, what kind of payment is it? And the batch control, again, you know, it's a tally up and it says how many transactions and what are the total amounts. Again, to make sure that nothing has been dropped or lost or changed. And then in between the batch header and the batch control, there are a bunch of entries. So I said that the file header was the one record. And the file control is the nine record. The batch header is the five record. And we'll see this again. And the batch control is the eight record. And in between, there are all these detailed, or I call transaction records. And the detail records are the six records. That's the identifier in the first position. And it basically says, where is, who is the receiving bank? Um, who is received to receive this payment and how much is it for? So I call that the payment record. And there can be many payment records in a batch. So one, one company, for example, can make many, many payments to a variety of different receivers, but they all came from the same uh, batch header, the batch from the company that it came from. And those are the six records, those entry details. But if you now look at this batch header as compared to this batch header. It's another batch header, second batch, and it too has one transaction. This one had three transactions, but this has one transaction, but what's different is this has an agenda record. An agenda record is um, the seven record, and it contains remittance information. So um, we're going to be talking about agenda records in a little bit. So in this sequence here, you can see that this is um, one file with two batches, and in this batch it had three items, three transactions, and this batch had one transaction, one entry, 
which had one addenda record. Okay, so I'm sure that when you look at this file, this is definitely TMI, but um, I, I'm just trying to tell a story and giving you, give you a feeling of what's in here. And remember I said that every field, and you can't see what the, how the fields are broken up here, um, but the NACHA book shows you exactly from character one to character 94, what every field is. But what I wanted to point out here is similar to the um, schematic that I showed a minute ago, the high level, um, this shows the record numbers. So I said that every file starts with a one and ends with a nine record. And in between, it has batch records. So this is the batch header, the five record. And I'm looking for an eight. Here is the batch control. That's the end of the batch. So the five and the eight. And then there are entries or transactions. There's the six record. And that says where the payment is going to and how much and to whom. And then there is the seven record. Those are the addenda records. So before, in the previous slide, I showed you a transaction that had only one addenda record, but there are certain types of transactions that have more than one, well, actually only one type of transaction called the CTX, and it can have up to 9,999 addenda records, and therefore remittance information. But looking at this slide, what I want you to take away is that there is a file that has, starts with a, a one and ends with a nine record. It has a batch header that's a five, and its batch control is an eight. It has, in this particular file, two transactions. There's a six record and another six record, two transactions. And each of these transactions happen to have um, remittance information in them in the addenda record. Okay, and yes, if you're looking at this bottom line, um, I don't want you to be confused about a second uh, row of, a second nine record. The ACH happens to be, the file system has to be blocked 10. So if a file has less than 10, block 10 records, groupings of 10, you have to put on um, lines of just nine. ACH is very specific. There's no room for anything, any counts or anything being off. And probably that's why I like it, because it's very precise. And that's so that when the operators get the files, we know exactly what to look for, and all of the participants know their job. Okay. Okay, so a little bit of review. There's only one file header in the in per ACH file. And there's one file control. And within each, you can have many batches. Um, you, each batch can have only one batch header and one batch control. And within each batch, you can have multiple entries, and, uh, which are the six records. And you can have multiple, uh, you can have one, one entry detail with associated uh, addenda records. And in the big picture, you can have multiple of the six records. Uh, all right, so some more detail about ACH files in general. So ACH files can have a mixture of what we call standard entry class codes. I haven't given you names of any other than so far the PPD, which is for um, uh, deposit, deposits for payroll and things like that. And I mentioned the CTX, which can have, is a, happens to be a corporate trade exchange payment. And that's the one that can have the 9,999 addenda records. But there are all kinds of files that the types of transactions that the banks, financial institutions send to us um, in their origination files. And then we're moving them to distribute them, that we send them in output files. So Credits and debits, typically, that's what, you know, we've been taught, we talked about in the schematics before. But there are something called pre-notes, where a transaction can be sent to the receiving, trans, uh, trans, receiving financial institution 
just to check if there is an account um, under the routing number and account at that financial institution. Freenode does not check anything else. It doesn't check if it's Sharon Jablon's account. It just checks that the bank is this, is there an account with this information? And it's sort of a heads up that we're going to be sending transactions to that account and routing them. Free notes also, just like credits and debits, all have rules and regulations about how they're issued, what has to be in them, and time frames. Um, there's also um, different types of transactions for returns and dishonored returns and um, there's something called reclamations. If someone passes away and the government wants to take that money back, they can send a reclamation. Um, a transaction can be sent, which is a death notification. Um, a, a gover that's a government transaction to a financial institution notifying them that someone has passed away. All of these categories of payments are defined in the ACH file. Okay, in addition to all that, and I hope I'm not driving everybody crazy with the detail, but again, I want to explain that the ACH does a lot of things and it is very, very specific. So within an ACH transaction, there are two digit codes that say whether the transaction is a debit or a credit or a non-monetary uh, transaction. Um, is it going to a, a demand account? Is it going to a account, what type of account. Is it a regular transaction or is it a pre-note or is it going to be a return? In addition to that, um, there are codes that say what the account is going into is. Is it a demand a credit account? Um, is it a debit account? Uh, is it a savings account? Okay. So, Rules. Let's, we're really going to talk about some rules, and the rules have to do with. Um, sorry. Um, so RDFIs are responsible for posting entries that they receive, and there and and different types of transactions have different um, uh, time frames. So each transaction comes into the ACH operator with an effective entry date, and that is the date that the originating bank and their customer want the payment to settle. And we do our best efforts to process that immediately and affect that uh, request. Um, in the big picture, debits uh, can't settle before the settlement date that gets assigned based on that effective entry date. And credits can't settle any later than um, the settlement date. So a bank, sometimes you'll see that you had a credit and it was memo posted, right? The, the bank got the payment. They are letting you know that you have it, but you really can't use those funds yet. So that's, you know, all part of the rule. And um, RDFIs, actually, they rely on the account number that came in on the transaction. So if a, um, a consumer or a corporate sends in a transaction, and it goes through the ACH and it is destined for a particular uh, financial institution based on the routing number and an account number. If there's a booboo in that account number and that account number exists, that payment is going to be posted to that account. Um, in general rule, and, and, and we'll talk about um, returns in a few minutes. Um, in terms of funds availability, there's a rule that consumer credit um, made by 5 p.m. local time, the day before settlement, must be made available um, to be withdrawn in cash by the opening of business on settlement date. And then there's a further rule that explains that it has to be either 9 a.m. or when the telefacility opens, including the ATMs. I'm not sure what that means because they're open always and the funds would be available, um, oh, the later of. So um, that would be 9 a.m. Uh, the next day, but again, rules, rules, and more rules. All right, so SEC codes, standard entry class codes, all of the numbers on this page, um, all of the numbers on this page, letters, combination, three different, three letters um, that are the standard entry class codes define every transaction 
that are in ACH file, every type. Um, so I'll just, you know, point out a couple. The CIE um, is a cu con customer, consumer initiated entry. It could be me sending a payment uh, to someone I know. Um, it could be me sending a payment to a company that I know, but it was initiated by a consumer. There's the PPD, I mentioned PPD um, a little while ago, PPD, prearranged payment and deposit. So that's the payroll uh, type uh, SEC code. Um, the CTX I mentioned, that's the corporate trade exchange. That's for corporate payments. And that's the one that can have 9,999 addenda records as compared to the CCD, corporate credit or debit. And that is, all, is also a corporate payment, but it only can have one addenda record. And there's specific um, transaction types defined for TEL and web. Um, there's a bunch of uh, codes SEC codes that are for consumers uh, paying corporate. So um, if someone were to give a check to uh, send a check to Verizon, uh, Verizon could take that check and what we call arc it, make it an accounts receivable open entry, accounts receivable entry, and that becomes an ACH transaction. And there are POP transactions. So those are for ones where you go into a store and they take your check, but they have to have a sign that says that this is the this will become an ACH entry, and then they do their magic, give you back your check, and that's and that transaction has become an ACH transaction. Um, IATs, and those are our international ACH transactions. And I want to mention here that you know I gave you the layout for all of our ACH. The, the one, five, six, seven, eight, and nine records. But IAT is a transaction all on its own. It, it's still 94 characters, but it has many, many different records than the standard ACH. It has its own batch header definition. It has um, a lot of different well-defined addenda records that define where the payments are going to and where they're coming from. And um, CORs, those are notifications of change. So if a payment goes to um, a financial institution, let's say someone sent a payment to Sharon Jablon, but um, Sharon Jablon has changed her bank account. Um, if Sharon Jablon has changed her bank account, um, the bank can send a notification of change to my bank saying, in the future, send those payments to a new account and routing number, or just a new account. Okay, oops. All right, so EDI, I said I would mention a little bit about EDI, I've actually mentioned most of this at least more than once. So EDI is electronic data interchange. It's been around for a long, long time, um, and it, also, it, it is, has its own structure, and I'll show you that later, um, and it, it defines transactions. And more than just defining transactions, it has the ability to go into great detail on remittance information. And, and so in the ACH, EDI is used when it travels with, the AC, with a payment to show what that payment is for. Um, so I mentioned CCDs, that's the standard entry class code. It can have one addenda record, one, and it should be an EDI formatted addenda record uh, in the addenda record. And then the CTX, that's the one that can have 9,999 addenda records, and it's intended to be a full EDI transaction. Okay, another file. And this one is not as pretty as the others, but I just wanted to um, make the point with this transaction, this, this is actually a file. Again, it starts with a one record, ends with a nine record. It has a five record, which is the batch header, and it has the eight record, which is the batch control. And it has the characters in here, ARC. 
So this is a payment that originally, the original forward item of this payment was a payment that someone made to Verizon for a payment and it was made, it was ARC, it was made into an ACH. And what, what's, it's sort of interesting on this, um, the account and routing number that's associated with this payment comes off the microline of the check. It, it's actually read off the microline of the check and it goes in, in the forward item. That's the one from the, oh, this is not a forward item, but from the originator to the receiver um, would have the microline from the check. And of course, microline of the check, there are standards um, that define that. But what's interesting besides that this is an art, this is actually a return. This is a return transaction. And I know that because of this code. So in the six record, the detail, this code of 26 actually means that it's a return of an ARC. And the R02 is um, the return of an ARC debit. So um, in telling you this, I want you to see that all of the fields for the different records um, are very specific. Okay. And I think this is the last graphic. So if you can bear with me, this is a healthcare transaction. Well, what I want you to notice in here are healthcare transactions, and there are two of them. And so again, of course, the file starts with a one and a nine, and you're probably tired of hearing me say that. But there are two healthcare transactions in this file. And NACHA and the NCVHS, which worked on behalf of HIPAA to um, define how remittance information uh, healthcare remittance information would be defined in the US ACH. Um, I just got a text that says they need my blood. I'm a negative. Okay, I think I'm doing that right now. That was supposed to be funny. Okay, so healthcare payments uh, have been defined by these characters. I hope you can see it HC claim payment. And this payment is a CCD. That's the CCD corporate payment, the SEC code. And it says that it's a healthcare claim payment. And if it's a healthcare claim payment, it must have these letters here. And this happens to be a payment from, this is a five record, from Enterprise Insurance to Dr. Walker. And what's significant here is that since it's a healthcare claim payment, it must have in its addenda record a TRAN or a trace segment, which this is a real EDI trace segment, and it has information about um, the, the equivalent of the explanation of benefits that Dr. Walker is going to be getting from enterprise insurance, not necessarily through the ACH, but through a clearinghouse or directly a healthcare clearinghouse or through enterprise insurance. So this is an example of a healthcare claim payment, and when Dr. Walker gets his explanation of benefits, he most likely has software to be able to find this trace segment and be able to hook it up, and he will know why he got a payment for, and here's the dollar amount. By the way, in ACH in the sixth record, the dollar amount is 10 digits, no decimal point, and this payment is for $857,700. $26.16. I'm sorry, $857,726.16. And the explanation of it is going to be found in the EDI that's going to come to them later, um, and they'll be able to hook it up. And similarly, here's another healthcare payment. Also, it's a, always a CCD. It says healthcare claim payment. It's from Sunshine Insurance to Maximum Hospital. And here's the trace number. And that's how um, healthcare uses, and there's many healthcare payments that go through the ACH. And so that's how those are defined. Okay, Steve asked me to include a, a, um, a slide that has some statistics. So this is for the entire ACH network. 
there were 24.7 billion transactions that flowed through the ACH network at a value of $55 trillion. So that breaks down to about 14 billion debits and 10 billion credits. Um, daily, we process us and the Fed, uh, EPN and Fed ACH, we process just under 100 million transactions a day, um, at, which is about 2 billion a month. And the volume is, in, according to NACHA statistics, the volume is increased by more than a billion transactions every year for the last five years. And in terms of value, it's increased by over a trillion dollars every year for the last seven years. Um, I also put on this slide just for you to see some of the types of transactions, and this indicates the growth over you know, from 2019 over 2018, and I took this from the NACHA website. Oops. Okay, so kind of a recap. What does EPN do? Our core business is processing payments. And files come into us from our EPN banks, those are the ODFIs, and we get files from the Fed, right? I told you about files that the Fed sees that are not from their banks, from their banks that they can't post because they're going to EPN banks. So we get in these files, they're all in NACHA format. We open up the files, we read them, we read every line, we check all of the mandatory fields, we edit for correctness, anything doesn't meet the edits, we reject them, and we return them. Um, then we route all of the transactions to the appropriate receiving bank. And I kind of said that, but as we're getting in all of these transactions, we look at the routing number in the six record to know where those transactions are going, and we put them in buckets for all of our banks. And so that when it's time to make a distribution, which we do based on a schedule up to about seven times a day. Um, and some banks can make, you know, make requests for additional um, deliveries of payments and some only get, you know, one or two of the small banks maybe only pick up files a couple times a day if there are files for them, um, minimally four. Um, and the processing window opens at six, really 6 a.m., really the end of day, is 4 a.m. We continue to get files, you know, 7 by 24, but the processing window really opens at 6 a.m. Um, I can see that one of the questions was when a record has an issue. Uh, it's hard for me to actually look at these questions, but as the whole, the question is when a record is um, has an issue, is the whole file rejected? The answer is no, and we set banks up. They have the option to say whether they want to be on file or batch level reject. Um, I mean, if a file is bad, we are going to reject the entire file. It happens very rarely. If um, an item is, is bad in a file and the bank is on file or batch level reject, we will just reject that file or that batch. Thank you for that question. Um, okay going. Um, okay, uh, this is um, a schematic, a very nice schematic, the next two on how we process. And it's basically what I just said. So these files come into us, EPN, um, from our originators, our participants, banks that have signed paperwork that say we're processing for them. We open up each file, we look at the routing number um, to see where those transactions are going. We do that by that nine digit routing number. We have a file called the customer information file. That's where we look up the routing number. And based on that, we decide if that, which bucket, which uh, receiver is gonna get that transaction. And we put those transactions in those buckets to be received by the receivers when we make our next distribution. And that is called intra-EPN, within EPN. Okay, similarly, um, we have, there's inter-EPN. So again, 
files come into us, we open up each item, we look at it, we hit it against the CIF file. If it's ours, we prepare to give it to our participants. But if it's not, we give it to our friends at FedACH. They have a similar system where they will look up that routing number and they will decide, ah, this is for one of our participants. So, you know, it, let's say Sharon Jablon was making a payment to um, a company in um, Hawaii, and Bank of Hawaii happens not to be an EPN participant. Um, my bank would send that transaction uh, to EPN. They are an EPN participant. EPN will look at who the receiver is, and they'll say, hmm, Bank of Hawaii is not ours. We will give it to the Fed. The Fed ACH will look at it and say, hmm, Bank of Hawaii, they're ours, and they will put it in the bucket for the for the Fed, for the Bank of Hawaii, and they will post it to the company or whoever I, Sharon Jablon was making that payment to at Bank of Hawaii. And, you know, again, I'll make a little commercial for the fact that with this system, we can reach all 12 or 14,000 banks in the United States. So the question about billing always comes up, and we don't, um, we never give out specific billing information, how we charge, but in the big picture, we charge for transactions. And I've been talking about transactions. So there's PPDs and CCDs and webs and tells and all different types of transactions. So we basically bill kind of by, like by records, and not just six records, and the vendor records, and you know, we count these things up and you know, we, billing is done that way. Um, this is a snapshot, and it, it's for nothing more than to give you a picture of what banks see and are thinking. Our banks, EPN banks, have the ability to look at a, a user system that we call EPN Access, and it um, shows them at any point in the day where they stand. So if you can see, and I know it's small, but the second row down shows that, and this is originated files, files they send to EPN. So this file um, was, and we identify files by the, the, the year, year, month, month, day, day. So this file came in um, in 2017, November 02, and it was called the A file. And that's how we call files, file data and modifier. And they sent that file into us and we looked at it and we said, okay, it has 24 items and it was 2,800 in debits and 800 in credits and um, and the status of it. And throughout the day, banks can see what they sent in to us and what we're making available to them. And some banks have a handful of files and some banks have many, many files. And on distributed files, they'll see that we've made, um, we've made advice files. Those are the ones that say what settlement information is. And if a file is a duplicate, if it's been sent in twice, we would mark it a duplicate. And some banks, and I didn't say this, relative to EPN, um, banks can originate and receive files to us either with um, Connect Direct for high volume, uh, FTP also high decent volume, or um, using EPN access over the internet. It's secure, um, the files are, in, the data is encrypted, you have to get in with a token, there's two level um, authentication to get in. Uh, I said I'd come back to EDI. We're getting close to the end. Um, I hope I'm not running over too much. Uh, so this is an ACH file. And again, just like everything else, it has the one, five, six, okay. addenda records, eight record, and nine. In the middle here are, is the EDI that um, says what is in the sixth record, what, what a remittance information um, is defined in this transaction. And actually, this is a payment from Jones Plumbing to Smith Fawcett. It's for $120.01. And here in the EDI, in EDI speak, it actually defines that this payment was for $120.01. And it actually was for three addenda, three, I'm sorry, three invoices, three um, invoices and open items. And RMRs are addenda information. Uh, I'm sorry, are uh, the type of remit. So there are two here that are IV that are invoices and one that is a open item. 
And on the next page, you can actually see what the EDI looks like. And again, there's, um, this is the payment. It says it was for $120.01. There are three invoice slash open items that are going to be posted. And it tells in detail to the receiver of that CTX what, um, uh, what that payment was for. And for those who are curious about how this EDI gets into the ACH so nicely, if you take all of these segments and the first two or three characters of each row here are called EDI segments, but take away the carriage return line feed and um, make it into one gigantic stream and divide by 20, I'm sorry, <laughs> divide by 80, you get all of these lines that neatly fit into the ACH in the addenda record. And that's what that looks like. So in the big picture of the customer experience, TCH, we use Great Plains Dynamics for accounting. We send files to our banks um, using EDI in our agenda records. We send CTXs. We send them actually to Verizon. <coughs> files and those files go to an ACH operator and the ACH operator sends those files to Verizon Bank and Verizon I'm sure that they do have um, EDI translators so they can post automatically but all banks have the ability to translate EDI into report format for their corporate customers and I didn't mention that there is a NACHA rule that says if a corporate customer asks for their um, asks for their remittance information, it must be delivered within two banking days. Rules, rules, and more rules. Okay, there's also exceptions. I mentioned uh, notifications of change. These also, and there are returns, and there's reversals, and everything has rules associated with them. I'm kind of skipping over some of this. There are all kinds of return entries that are very specific that um, are for, that define that the account is closed or frozen or insufficient funds or unable to uh, find a place to post that payment. And those um, returns are sent back from the RDFI through the operator to the banks that originated it on behalf of their originator. And there are, there are time limits on all these different kinds of payments and returns. So I think the almost last thing to say, next to last thing to say, is there is a whole system of fines, rules enforcement by NACHA. And um, depending on violations, there's three levels of violations. You can read this yourself. Um, the fines start low, and depending on the level of uh, infraction, you know, willful disregard, um, violations can be up to $100,000. And they can ultimately cause suspension. And, you know, we are very careful with who we bring on to the network. And just as a little story, years ago, I was bringing on a bank. And um, the president of our division realized that that bank had a customer who at the time was doing gambling. And there was no gambling on the system, systems in ACH at the time. And he went to the bank and he said, you, you have to let go of this customer. And this gambling customer, and the bank said no, and we stopped, and we did not bring this bank on to process with us. So since the ACH has very stringent rules. Um, the last thing I wanted to go over was just this comparison between ACH, CHIPS, and RTP. So the ACH, you know, as I've said, it's a batch store and forward system. CHIPS, the wire payment systems, CHIPS and, and Fed um, Wire, they're both individual transactions. CHIPS is for credits only. Um, a CHIPS payment can be up to one penny less than a billion, $10 billion. You can compare that to ACH. We consider ACH low value, but ACH is a, a penny under $100 million. Um, chip, CHIPS is a hybrid. It's a real-time net system. And we say that because as payments are coming into us, um, banks can banks do fund their accounts. And as um, payments are coming into chips, 
we're looking to see if the bank has the money and wants to make payments. And if a bank has a really big payment that they want to make, but they don't have the funds, they can either um, uh, use a liquidity mechanism to add money to their account, or they can say, no, we're just going to wait. And as we get payments in and what we have in our account goes up, we will then make the payment. So it's really a hybrid, but it's a real, and if the funds are in the account, we make the payment immediately. Um, chips as compared to ACH is final, finality. There are no returns. I had here on the slide initially no backseas, and marketing took that out. So, you know, in ACH, transactions can be returned or reversed, not so in chips. They cannot be returned. You have to, the originator of that transaction would have to call the bank and say, please. Um, chips can have remittance information. By the way, you know, well, ACH is the NACHA formats. Chips is being rewritten to use the ISO 20022 formats. Today, it uses what looks, uses MT-like formats, the Swift MT format. And Chips processes from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. Eastern time. And in terms of chips, the other operator in the U.S. is Fedwire, and they're a real-time growth settlement system. They settle as the payments come in. And then there's RTP. Again, individual transactions, credits only. Today um, can be up to $100,000 per payment. Um, immediate availability on chips payments. Um, and uh, they process and the um, originator of the payment is, there's a, it's a big messaging system and the originator of the payment um, will hear back um, within 15 seconds that the receiver, receiver got it. Um, and actually that's the SLA 15 seconds, I believe, but I think we're seeing two to three seconds for the round trip. Um, also, finality, there are no returns or reversals or recalls. Um, what else? Oh, so CHIPS includes some, I'm not CHIPS, RTP includes non-financial messages and something really interesting is the request for payment. So the sender of the payment, the originator can send to another company, for example, you owe me this dollar amount and this is the detail for it and then the receiver of that can flip it around and send the payment. And RTP also includes acknowledging, acknowledgement of payments and can include remittance information. Uh, RTP also uses ISO 20022 format, and it is a 24 by 7 clearing and settlement with immediate confirmation um, of the payments to um, the sender of the payment. Uh, in terms of um, other U.S. operators, there is none today, but Fed has now uh, announced and is in design of Fed Now. And that is it. And I hope some of you are still with me. I appreciate the time that I've had uh, to convey all of this. I hope it wasn't TMI. And uh, okay, Ambria and Steve. Well, thank you, Sharon. Thank you for that wonderful presentation. Um, it was definitely very informative. There were a lot of comments in the chat about how great the information was, so we know that everyone definitely appreciated it. Um, just as a reminder, there will be a brief survey sent out to all participants. So if you could just take two minutes just to complete the survey, um, it will be in your inbox shortly. We would greatly appreciate that. We're now going to go ahead and open up the floor of the questions. And I know um, there were several questions received. In fact, um, I was able to grab them, Sharon, and uh, put them in a Word document. So I'm just going to share that really quick. For those who are able to stay on and um, um, stay on for the question and answer period, that's great. Um, if there are some who aren't able to stay on, the uh, the questions, a copy of the questions and answers will be sent out to the attendees afterward. So you may not be able to get through all of the questions today just because there were quite a bit, uh, but just wanted to to let you all know. So Sharon, I don't I don't know if you I I pulled these right off of the um 
right off of the chat. Okay. So I, don't, I don't know if you I, wanted to try to tackle some of them uh, but I, before we I, end today. Okay. Um, what's funny is I can actually see that um, somebody, Jose, actually answered um, answered some questions. Um, one of the questions was, and I, I not showing. I don't know which slide I had been showing, but there was um, the beginning of a six record was. 622, and what the question was is 22 um, is in the entry detail, is it a credit? And yes, a 22 is a demand credit. Um, so let's see. Um, I answered that other question. Okay, does ACH process ISO 20022 format through the, all right, do we process it? That's a really good question. I meant to mention something about it. Okay, no, ACH does not process today anything ISO 20022. Having said that, uh, NACHA um, made a couple of rules. There's actually a, you could put ISO 20022 in a CTX in the addenda record, but the, um, but two banks have to join, it's an opt-in, and so at least two banks have to join so that they know that ISO 20022, ISO 20022 is going to be in the, uh, in the ACH CTX uh, addenda record. And my understanding is that no one, that was a couple of years ago, um, so any kind of a transaction in theory of ISO could be in there, a payment transaction, or even they have remittance uh, transaction. But to my knowledge, no one has ever joined, and I don't believe as of at least a year ago, any ISO has traveled through the ACH. Um, somebody asked, how many payments are routed through EPN versus Fed ACH? Um, well, in terms of commercial traffic, we process uh, depending on the month, we process over half, 51, what have you, percent of all ACH volume. Um, are, <laughs> I'm not, how are, I think I answered how are payments routed through EPN versus Fed ACH. They're, they're routed to us via our banks. So if a bank is signed up to be TCH, signed up and is an EPN bank, um, then uh, they come to us. They, they're signed up for us. They connect to us to one of our many mechanisms. If a bank is signed up through Fed ACH, they come in through Fed ACH. Um, are credits and debits considered in relation to originator or receiver uh, for better understanding? So the way I think of it, it's the originator sends a credit or a debit, um, you know, into the ACH. So from the originator's perspective, it's a credit or a debit. Um, the, the payment travels through the ACH. If it's a credit, the bank will deposit it into their account, to the receiver's account. If it's a debit, the bank is going to withdraw the money out of their account. So I think it, it's from the, the originator's perspective. And then there were returns, and that makes it a little bit more confusing because when, a when I think about things, because when a return is done, a return is really a debit, um, and the receiver, the original receiver of the account is now the originator of, the, of that transaction, and they are going to get the money back. That's, so that's sort of a debit. You could call that a debit. Um, Uh, let's see, what does the second batch header represent? Is it a different company? So the batch header um, defines who the company, who the payment is coming from. There's actually, um, on the right side of the file, there is a trace number, and part of the trace number is the routing number of who originated that file. Um, Will each batch correspond to a single ODFI? 
Yeah, well, well, each batch originated to the clearinghouse is going to be EPN or Fed ACH. H, yes, it corresponds. It came from one ODFI because the ODFIs are the ones who are creating the batches and sending the files into us. We then break apart the files that those individuals, um, so let's say Sharon's hat company paid five people, but those five people all are at different banks, right? So I'm sending in a batch of ACH, possibly PPD credits, and the clear, when EPN or Fed ACH gets them, they are going to break them up into um, what are going to become batches for those five different banks and to be able to deliver them to five different banks. And then they will, we will, or Fed ACH, will make those batches. Okay. What is the data quality in these records? Specifically, are there checks on things like merchant names? Okay. It's, it, it is the bank's responsibility um, to adhere to the NACHA rules, to, quote, know your customer, to make transactions that make sense. We, the operators, do not check things like that. We check um, bank name, you know, that it's a bank, that it has an appropriate routing number, that the routing number is eight digits and a check digit, that the bank account can, is up to 17 digits, can even include an alpha, we, you know, that the, there's a dollar amount and the dollar amount makes sense compared to, you know, whether, uh, whether it's a credit and there's a dollar amount or if there's no dollar amount and there it was supposed to be a, um, a, a, a zero dollar account. We check those things, but we don't edit for individual names and company names. We wouldn't have that information. Um, Does one batch represent one payment? It could. You could have a batch with one payment in it. It's like when we were looking at the healthcare, um, the healthcare schematic, it had, I think, one batch, but it had at least maybe 10 payments in it. But one healthcare payment could be in a batch all by itself, yes. But it would be very inefficient for the bank to put together and for us to process. But the answer to that is it could be. Um, what kind of security cryptography is used to protect all of this? Is secure hardware required as it is for payment processing? So, okay. Um, there is all kinds of security and encryption involved in all, all aspects of processing ACH files. They, uh, files come into us over secured lines. The data is encrypted. We decrypt in terms of FTP. I know certificates are used on both sides. When um, companies use our EPN access with tokens, that also has two levels of authentication and the data is encrypted. Um, and our data uh, on our site that the banks look at to see some of their data, those files are encrypted as well. Oh, there's a question down there. Um, is ACH always, always domestic? Well, the IAT record is an ACH record that is, that, that means that the receiver of the funds is ultimately not a U.S. domiciled bank. And that will ultimately be passed to overseas um, through um, a service provided by the Fed. Um, do control records include checksum to prevent file tampering? Exactly. There are certain fields, yes, that's question 14. There are certain fields in um, the eight record and nine record that are tallies of things such as the um, routing numbers. So that kind of added up, but then kind of done a numerical checksum to um, make sure that that file came in and goes out the same way. Absolutely true. Um, can you show where it mentions if it is a debit or a credit on that example? So 
um, you know, we're way past the slide, but if you look at the schematic, the, the files that I actually showed, and right after the, 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 the name of the file, the six, uh, let's say the six record, you'll see two digits. It could be 22 is um, a demand credit. Uh, it might be a 27. I don't think I had any debits. Um, 27 is a demand debit. I did show a 26, which was a return um, on the one with an arc. So it's the second and third digit after the file number. You know, when I said uh, the file number, um, the, the one, five, six, seven, eight, nine records, the, the number that follows that, that tells whether it's a credit or a debit or whatever else. Um, and question number 17, Sharon, I highlighted that because you answered it during the presentation. Right. So if you want to skip it, you can. Okay, thank you. Um, could a situation arise where an ODFI sends the same file to both TCH as well as the Fed? I'm going to say no, because we each have, I mean, they could do a major boo-boo and try to, but when, when both EPN and the Fed get the files, we open the file and we look for the routing number that the file came from. Um, and we would see that it's not, you know, if it was misdirected, uh, we would know immediately. We would not process that file. Um, I'll call it, in full disclosure, we have had situations, very rarely, where a bank will send in the same file to us twice by accident. Um, I'm sure FedACH sees the same thing. And when that happens, um, we mark that file as a dupe and we let that bank know and we don't process it. Um, and then in addition, sometimes the bank may remake a file and it's not the same file, but it has a lot of the same items in it. And then the bank has to reverse it or you know, figure out which transactions were duplicated and reverse them. That's all part of the ACH and how reversals and everything are handled. That's all in the rules of that ACH. Um, just trying to read. Does TCH have an application to electronically manage bank to, oh, you know, I, what, what, this reminds me of something, bank to bank. Um, intra EPN settlement electronically. Okay, so yeah, everything is done electronically. Um, what I didn't say is when we were looking at settlement that there's a rule, the Fed settles anything it touches. So when I was showing that example where Sharon made a payment to Bank of Hawaii, right? The Fed would settle that because they touch it. Um, the EPN, we use the, the Fed's national net settlement system or automated system um, to settle our um, intra-EPN payments from our banks to our payments. And we settle that out and we then send the netting numbers based on routing numbers to the FRB for them to do settlement and, you know, to settle up the account. And it is all electronic. There's nothing that's faxed, um, nothing that's keyed. Okay, is there a limit to the number of addenda records per payment? Yes, the CCD plus 9,999 addenda records. Yes, there have been transactions that had more, but they get broken off um, somehow or other by, a, by the bank into uh, two payments. Um, how will FAST ACH affect file record format? I'm not sure what FAST ACH, but if that's same day ACH, um, same day ACH, the files look exactly the same, except that in the effective entry, no, the effective, effective entry date, the, that in that field, it has to have the date, the same date as is um, today's date that's being processed. So um, if it's not that date, if it's tomorrow, it's not going to be same day, but everything else in terms of record and format is the same. And there is an optional field that um, a code can be put in that says that you wanted same day. Uh, so same day, those files get processed 
based on the deadlines that what time files came into us, um, which same day window they came in. Does the clearinghouse facilitate real time payments? Yes. So RTP is the clearinghouse's real time payment network. It is ours and ours alone. Um, and anyone is uh, able to join uh, RTP, um, whether they are members of the clearinghouse, whether they're members of EPN, any bank can join RTP, and we have banks of all sizes. Um, so it is a, our network, it has its own rails, and I hope I've answered that question. Where can we find the ACH file specification? And I love those questions. They, I am, they are in the NACHA rules book. Uh, since I'm kind of quarantined in the Berkshires, I have a very old NACHA rules book on my lap. Um, but if you look at it, kind, and it may be still the same, um, I don't know if it's the same appendix, but it's about a, you know, a quarter of the way in most NACHA books. And if you just flip through, you're going to see record layouts many, many pages of record layouts. So um, if you can't find it, let me know. Give me a call. My name, my phone number is on my, on the last slide. And my email and, address. Okay. And just one more thing, one more thing, Sharon. I, someone asked if um, you could answer question 13. I'm not sure if you, if you missed that one or not. Oh, yeah. What are some of the fraud risk validity checks that the network does and when does it do it? Okay, so validity checks we're doing as every transaction is coming in, we are, you know, editing every single field that is, remember I said mandatory, right? Anything that's mandatory, we are editing. You know, fields can't be bigger than they're supposed to be because then they will mess up next fields. In terms of fraud and risk, um, we monitor um, for, for fraud and risk in transactions, and um, and I'm, the name of the, the the service that we provide escapes me at the moment. Um, Olivia Maciel at the Clearinghouse um, monitors that on a daily basis and sends out reports. I think it's EPN Watch, it's EPN Watch series. And for banks who sign up for it, um, we monitor what is going on, um, if they're getting too many returns, too many what type of returns, and, and that's handled with our EPN watch. And if there's an EPN customer on here that's not aware of it, reach out to me or Olivia, and you can be set up for it. Great, and then the last uh, question um, in the chat, <laughs> Someone asked if, um, I don't know if you covered question two already or not. Um, are there any rules, are there any rules, exceptions that TCH or Fed follow beyond NACHA specified rules? Ooh. Um, um, well, I, I mean, we all have our own way, we both have our own way of processing payments and what we do throughout the day. Um, our times may vary a tad. I want to say that TCH and Fed ACH are very similar and we do follow the NACHA rules. Um, the only thing I didn't mention at all is that the Treasury, which originates, right, originates um, Treasury payments to Fed ACH follows some additional rules, and they're in something called the Green Book. Um, but in general, Fed ACH processes the way that we both process to the NACHA rules. I would say basically with some of the exceptions by um, like Fed ACH. And in that way, I mean, I remember that when same day came out, uh, the Treasury didn't do same day. They didn't do same day when um, the rest of the NACHA family um, started doing same day. But that doesn't mean Fed ACH didn't process um, same day from their banks. I hope that answer was clear. I, I think so. And it, it looks like, yes, they, they responded back and, and said thank you in the chat. So um, thank you again, Sharon, for this 
um, excellent presentation. Again, it was extremely informative. We had a lot of positive feedback in the chat area. So you, you definitely, definitely uh, did a great job. We also want to thank the Clearinghouse um, for letting us borrow you <laughs> for today. Um, but, but thank you again. Um, if there aren't any other questions in the chat, we'll just uh, close out with some little announcements. Um, the, like I said, mentioned earlier, the recording of the webinar and a, a copy of the slide deck will be sent out to all those who register. Um, we'll also be sending out a copy of uh, these questions with answers to, to the, those who registered as well. And um, the X9 is always putting out uh, or offering free webinars to, to the public. So be sure to check out our website, x9.org, and follow us on Twitter, LinkedIn, and Facebook um, to find out more about any upcoming webinars or events that we might be uh, having. We do have one planned for the fall, so you should see more information about that shortly. Um, Sharon, is, is there anything else that you wanted to say before we close up today? Well, I want to say on behalf of me and the Clearinghouse, um, I want to thank you for giving me the opportunity to, you know, share information and learning about the ACH. We definitely appreciate it, and thank you. And thank you to all those who were able to attend um, and register. We definitely appreciate your participation. Again, if you have any, if anyone has any questions or like any additional information, please contact us at admin, A-D-M-I-N, at x9.org, or you can just go onto our website, x9.org, and contact us directly from the site. We want to thank everyone again, and have a great day.